Hi everyone, how's it going? Sorry to interrupt conversations. Um, welcome to this talk. Hi, welcome. Come on in. Thanks for joining. Um, hi, so I'm going to stand on this platform because I'm a bit taller on this platform. I'm quite short. Um, so if I have to wander off, you'll see the height change in a minute as I step down from what is essentially a booster. Um, hi, it's nice to meet you all. I really appreciate you choosing this session over some of the other really good sessions that are on at the same time. Um, and it's nice to be here in Luxembourg. It's my first time here. It's really great trying out my basic French from school, which is really not great. Um, so I apologize if I do try that later on with any of you. But um, yeah, it's lovely to be here. I'm, my name is Grace Jansen. I'm a developer advocate at IBM, if you didn't get the logo on the shirt. Um, and I'm from England, if the accent didn't give it away. <laughs> So um, yeah, it's great to be joining you here today. I mostly work with Java and cloud native technologies, and that's hopefully what I'm going to be covering today in this session. But before I became a developer advocate, I actually did a degree in biology, specializing in fish, which has really come in really useful to cloud native application development. Um, but if anyone wants to chat about that later, I'll be around for the next couple of days. Happy to have a conversation about that weird and wonderful journey from biology to tech. But today, um, I'm going to be using, again, some analogies, because I like to be able to bring my interest in biology to tech to hopefully sort of give concrete analogies and sort of um, comparisons between biology-related subjects and technology-related subjects, especially when they can be quite abstract and complicated and chaotic. So today, I'm going to be taking a look at how we become cloud-native physicians. So, or doctors, so how we can use metrics and traces to be able to hopefully diagnose our cloud native applications. Um, if you saw the session earlier by Dotan, uh, there's some similarities here in the content, uh, but I'm going to be focusing a bit more on the instrumentation steps rather than visualization, storage, and analysis. So, if my clicker works, no, luckily my laptop's in. Okay. So what can we learn from medicine? Why am I making this comparison between being a cloud native physician or doctor? When actually, when we think about how, what happens when we go to a doctor in terms of how we diagnose ailments or diseases or syndromes or conditions, what usually happens is we end up diagnosing with biometrics. So there are loads of different biometrics that doctors collect when it comes to trying to diagnose what might possibly be wrong with us. Uh, so things like physical symptoms, it might be written notes, heart monitors, you know, we can get right on in there with scans in 3D, different colors. It's amazing the types of information that we can get out of the human body now to be, actually, to be able to accurately diagnose exactly what's going on when it comes to, you know, different symptoms maybe being associated with similar diseases. And actually we do similar things in software. So we still try and diagnose our applications with a lot of metrics. So we have things like our app health, API requests, uh, memory consumption, error rates, number of users connected to our system. And all of this is what we try and use to be able to diagnose our systems, just like we try and diagnose in medicine. But there's a big difference in diagnosing an adult versus diagnosing a baby. <laughs> so what is this difference? And please don't say it's because they can't talk, because that's way too obvious an answer. Um, it's kind of related. Uh, but it's because what we're missing when it comes to, you know, as a, as a physician, as a doctor, what we're missing in babies that we're able to get from adults is context. Understanding what's happened before, what's happened after, what's happened in the past. What were the events leading up to this particular patient's conditions? Did they bump their head? Did they fall down? Did they have a panic attack? Were they stressed? Had they gone through um, a particular event, for example? Is their family history? Adding in that context is something that, as a baby, we're not able to provide, which is why usually the babies are accompanied by an adult to provide that context. And that's how we're able to accurately diagnose. But with those, with, you know, if we just took those biometrics that we saw earlier, so you know, physical symptoms, written notes, heart monitors, blood oxygen levels, often you could see a list of symptoms, and it could be possible to have four different syndromes that all have those possible symptoms. Whereas by adding in that context, whether it be family history, whether it be sort of that context of events that have happened, we can, more narrow, we can narrow that down to a more specific condition or syndrome. And it's the same when it comes to software. We can't just rely on the numbers themselves. We have to be able to actually understand in what context those numbers occur um, and why they mean the things they do. So that's why I want, hopefully, for us to take a step towards where we go with medicine in software and become cloud-native doctors, because that sounds easy. 
Yeah. Um, it is, I promise. Uh, so we're going to become cloud native physicians or doctors in this session today, hopefully adding in some context into those all important observability metrics by utilizing things like distributed tracing. So observability. Going into more, I've kind of done the analogy part. You'll be pleased to know this is not a biology lecture, I promise. Um, but we're going to dive into how do we actually enable that context? How do we enable distributed tracing and enable that? And I'm going to do a demo to hopefully show that it is relatively easy to get started enabling that in your Java applications. So when it comes to observability, there are three key steps. And actually, Dotan touched on this earlier, and we have very similar steps, uh, which is unsurprising given that these are kind of standards. So the first step is this instrumentation step. So we need to actually be able to collect the metrics, because if we don't have any metrics to collect, there ain't no point having visualizations and analysis and storage, because we've got nothing to visualize. So we've got to make sure that we're actually collecting the relevant information from our apps and instrumenting our applications in a way that enables us to collect that information. The second stage is once we've got that data, are we able to then send that somewhere, uh, hopefully an external system, to be able to store and analyze it? And there's lots of tools available already in the open source that allow you to be able to do this, whether it be Jaeger, Zipkin. Um, there's lots of other tools out there that you can utilize, including proprietary tools. And the third step is once we've stored and analyzed it, how do we actually get that information in a, in a way in which we can easily understand it, spot trends, and, and gain insights into what those numbers mean. And that's where visualizations come in, and insights, things like query capabilities, to be able to understand what the numbers mean and why that might affect us. In this session, I'm just going to be focusing, as I said, on this instrumentation step. So how do we enable these metrics to be collected from our applications in the first place? How do we send out this data? Uh, if you want more on steps two and three, check out Doton's recording. I'm just going to keep pointing to that one because it bounced really well off mine. Um, cool. So when it comes to instrumentation, there are three key pillars. There's logs, metrics, and distributed tracing. Now, this isn't to say that these are all the data you could possibly collect that enables effective observability. There's other data you could collect as well. Things like end user monitoring and profiling are some of the additional sort of foundational pillars that are being considered to be added to specifications like open telemetry. They're not yet part of it, but again, these are useful metrics that in the future would be useful to add. But for just now, hey, we're just going to focus on those core three logs, metrics, and distributed traces. Now, I promise I'm not going to spend too long on the logs and metrics because I imagine, I mean, does anyone here not log in their application? Excellent. I was hoping that would be the answer. Cool. OK, so uh, we're past the logging phase, which is always useful. I did have one guy in one presentation raise his hand. Very brave. Very brave. But I do wonder what he's building. Um, but cool, we've got logging. So logs is sort of your really foundational level here. Um, having that time-stamped message, being able to emit um, sort of very higher level granular information to gain context at that point in time. Um, we also have metrics sort of building on to that foundational level. Uh, metrics allow us to be able to go that one step further, and instead of just having that information at a singular point in time, being able to have information over a range in time so that we can understand how that behavior in our application is changing over time to be able to see those trends um, and be able to do things like uh, understand correlation, uh, be able to do statistical and mathematical um, sort of um, transformations on that data to understand it better. So things like uh, probabilistic, statistical, whether it be sampling, aggregation, summarization, correlation, that's where metrics can be really useful. And there's a wide range of metrics that we were able to collect about our applications, depending on what you're interested in. When it comes to metrics, there's um, lots of inbuilt tools into a lot of uh, sort of existing, uh, say, application servers or um, sort of tooling that you might be using to enable your application. One that I like to refer to is MicroProfile. Uh, has anyone come across MicroProfile before? Oh, there's only a few hands. OK, cool. Uh, I'm glad I got the slide in here. So welcome to MicroProfile. Um, this is an open source uh, standard or specification that was introduced to enable sort of Java EE and Jakarta EE applications to really be ready for the cloud. So it enables additional APIs that build on top of Java EE or Jakarta EE, depending on which you're using, um, that enable you to be able to create effective microservice-based applications ready for the cloud. 
So it includes things like uh, restful communication, uh, being able to use things like JSONB, JSONP, uh, utilizing things like open API, so being able to document your APIs in a standardized way, uh, being able to utilize reactive uh, security in JWT. But the one I wanted to point out for this particular part is the fact that we have metrics in this specification. So MicroProfile metrics enables you to be able to collect a wide variety of metrics in a standard format. So it doesn't matter sort of which application server you're using. As long as you're writing with this standard MicroProfile, you can switch between multiple different compatible runtimes. So it gives you that sort of flexibility and portability that we really want from cloud native applications. As you can see, the nice thing is, is that MicroProfile as a specification is developed by a wide range of individuals and vendors. Uh, so it really is supposed to be vendor agnostic. That's the whole point of it. So you're not trapped into one particular vendor and have to do a load of work to be able to switch if you needed to. So at the moment, uh, this is the latest list as far as I'm aware um, and as far as it says on the MicroProfile website as to which of these have compatibility with each of the major versions of MicroProfile. But I just wanted to put this table up here to show just how many vendors are really um, sort of getting on board with the MicroProfile specification, allowing you to have that flexibility um, from loads of different uh, sort of vendors and companies. So it's a really thriving community that is um, constantly being developed and built upon. So this is the specification I was talking about, this particular API. Um, as I said, aiming to provide that standardization, that unified way of being able to collect metrics um, and export metrics as that monitoring data to any management agents you might be using. So a really great way uh, if you want to, if you're not already using another metrics, maybe Prometheus or whatever, um, you might want to check out MicroProfile because uh, it is a really great tool to use. And we have a guide on it. Um, I should mention our guides because I'm going to be using one later. So um, if any of you want to get hands on with any of the technology I'm showing in this, uh, so whether it be Open Liberty, which is the application server that I help develop. Has anyone heard of Open Liberty before I continue on that one? Got like two hands. Yeah, of course you have. I've uh, got like three hands and it's people I know, so that doesn't help. Um, OK, so has anyone heard of WebSphere? Yeah, OK, like loads more nods, right? Yeah, it's like it's a classic. So WebSphere is our more like older, more designed for like monolithic applications. To be honest, it's pretty bulky. It's quite difficult to use a lot of the time. And we kind of realized that it wasn't really designed for the cloud. So what happened was we took the best parts of WebSphere and made it into a much l more lightweight, modular cloud native runtime. So that's where Liberty was created, WebSphere Liberty, kind of based off the original name. Um, much more lightweight, as I said, modular, so you can just plug and play the features that you want to use. So much more designed for the cloud in mind, but still as performant and offering pretty much most of the same features, which is nice. Um, then in 2017, that got open sourced. So now it's called Open Liberty, um, and that's the one I'm going to be using in my demo today. Um, and it was mentioned, yeah, there, Open Liberty, and you can see Webs for Liberty li listed there as well. Um, and that's the one I'm going to be using. We have loads of guides on the Open Liberty website. We're quite proud of them, so we'd love for people to use them more. Um, they take you through all of the microprofile specifications, Ducati E specifications, and additional ones on top, like test containers, for example. So if you ever want to learn a new technology or tooling that you might want to use in Java, uh, we usually have a guide on it. If we don't, raise an issue, and we're, we're, we're trying to work on new guides all the time. The nice thing is you don't have to have any prerequisites on a local machine. We have a browser-based learning environment that you can use um, for free. So I'll show you that later. But you can do a guide on MicroProfile Metrics on that website if you're interested. OK, so moving on to the third and final pillar, so tracing. And this is where I'm going to spend the majority of my time because it's often the one that people haven't yet used. And this is where we can start to relate it back to that concept of becoming a cloud-native doctor by providing this all-important context. So distributed tracing, tracing, often it's called distributed just because we're using it in sort of cloud native distributed environments with microservices. But essentially, this is all about having this sort of um, this link between the different operations and requests that might be occurring between the different multiple microservices you might have within your cloud native application. So as the name suggests, it traces a path through the different microservices, through the requests that are made um, as they disseminate through your multi-service architectures. Um, so distributed tracing, the, 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 where, the reason that this has to be added as a third pillar is because where logs and metrics fall down is that they are system scoped. 
So they are only giving you insight into that particular, say, point in time, if it's a log, that particular microservice, for example, if you're using metrics, you don't really get the end-to-end -end picture of how requests are disseminating through your multi-service architecture, getting that all-important context if you're not adding in things like distributed tracing to understand where in a particular process something might be going wrong. You might be getting error messages in your logging, but not necessarily understanding the context of what's happened before, where in my process has something gone wrong, and how do I then fix that? So it's kind of like finding a needle in a haystack, trying to find that point in your system where something's gone wrong, whereas this is giving you that sort of map, that mapping to be able to actually identify exactly where so you can more directly pinpoint that issue and solve it quicker, hopefully. So some key concepts to understand when it comes to tracing. So we've got different sort of key words uh, that you'll need to be familiar with when it comes to tracing so that you understand the different components you'll need to enable if you want to use this in your own applications. So the first one is traces, and that is just sort of the overarching term we use to describe um, the requests, and it usually consists of multiple spans. So I've got an image, hopefully. I'm, I'm a graphical person, so I tend to try and put images in all my slides. So on the image here, on the right-hand side, you've got the trace, which is represented by that orange strip at the bottom. And then, as I said, it consists of multiple spans. What is a span? Well, a span is a representative of usually a single operation in a request. You can see those represented by those pink boxes by each of my um, microservices or, or components of my application um, on the right-hand side as well. Normally, a span contains a, sort of a collection of data. Normally, it's things like a, a name, time-related data, log messages, and any metadata that's really vital to give information on what's occurring during that transaction or that particular request. And then on top of that, we have this all-important context. So this is where we're gaining that all-important what's happened and, and how, does this, how do the symptoms we're seeing relate to what might be potentially be going wrong. So context is usually contained within the span data. It's an immutable object. And what it enables us to do is to be able to actually understand where in a particular request that particular uh, point occurred and how all of them connect together to form that trace, that end-to-end -end path through our application. So normally, trace context is typically composed of two different values. You've got the trace ID, and you've got the parent ID. So you can see some examples that I've included in my diagram here. The trace ID is usually the unique identifier that's assigned. Uh, it's usually generated in the root span, so the first single operation within that trace, within that request. And it's kept the same for every single span within that request, so every single operation, so that you can then trace right all of those spans, all of those particular uh, components were part of that singular request. So you can see that my trace ID doesn't uh, change in the purple boxes. That's my context in my diagram. The other one is the parent ID. That one does change. And what that allows us to be able to do is to be able to understand the order in which those particular transactions uh, or particular operations occurred within that one request. So the parent ID um, is usually the span ID of the parent that spawned the current operation. That was easy to understand. No, um, basically, it's easier on my diagram, which is why I put it in there. Um, so you can see my trace ID in the first bit of context is the same um, ABC123, originally named, uh, as the span ID from the parent that spawned that operation. And again, you can see parent ID number two is DEF456, and that's the same as the span ID from the previous parent span. So you can see that by doing this, by having the combination of a trace ID and a parent ID, not only can we understand that all of those operations are part of the same request, the same end-to-end -end path, but we can also backtrace. So we can work backwards and understand exactly where in that request something might have gone wrong and what was the parent span that created that operation and why did it go wrong, allowing us to really nail down that particular issue, failure, or bottleneck. So that's that all-important context. Okay. So those were the three pillars of observability, but so far, all I've talked about is quite high-level stuff and not really gone into how we actually go about doing this. It's just the nitty-gritty. So we're going to go into that now. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is open telemetry, which is sort of um, it's an open source specification that we can utilize. Um, and I'm going to go into how we can utilize that with MicroProfile in Java applications. So open telemetry, in the past, it was quite difficult to be able to instrument our applications because often what happened is each observability backend had um, 
its own instrumentation libraries and agents for emitting data to the tools, and it meant there were no standardized ways in which we could easily create an instrument or application to have that standardized format. So it meant if we changed observability backends, we'd have to rewrite the code to be able to produce uh, to the right agents or libraries the uh, monitoring data that we wanted to collect. So it became very frustrating. Um, then the community kind of got together and was like, right, we should really have like a standardized way of doing this. Um, and unfortunately, although they did create standards, there wasn't one, which was a bit of an issue because it's kind of an oxymoron to have multiple standards. Um, so yeah, we had open sensors and open tracing and both were quite good at what they did individually, but it was kind of understood that like, why do we have two standards? That doesn't really make much sense. Um, so the best parts of them got combined together to create this project open telemetry. So now there is one standard which is a relief. We don't have to learn multiple. Um, so this is supposed to uh, really aimed at being a portable standard that we can use across multiple different uh, tooling, uh, implementations, um, and different sort of libraries and languages as well. Um, if you uh, haven't come across, who has heard of OpenTelemetry? Anyone who was in Dotan's talk? Cool, yeah. Um, so if you haven't come across OpenTelemetry, it is a CNCF incubating project, and it is um, it's the second largest uh, project that is contributed to other than Kubernetes. So it really has a big following. Um, it has, it, it's got a lot of development going into it at the moment, and a lot of communities are, are picking up this specification as a standard to use in their own specifications. Um, so one of those is MicroProfile, which we'll go into in a minute. The important thing to note here is uh, there is a lot of, a lot of assumptions are often made about OpenTelemetry because it sort of has this so it's this reputation of being this observability standard. A lot of people make the assumption that that means they can use it for the entire end-to-end -end observability like process. Um, but actually, it's important to note that it's not a full observability backend. It does not do things like the storing and analysis, the visualization. That's where you need to plug it into those additional tools that I talked about, like Jaegen, uh, Jaeger, Prometheus, Zipkin, Grafana, um, all of those great open source tools you can utilize in addition to OpenTelemetry to then gain that entire end-to-end -end process. If you remember those three steps, we're just looking at the instrumentation right now, but there's also the storage and analysis and visualization and insights. Um, if you want more on that, watch the recording. Um, cool. So the way that it works is a little bit like this. Um, so this is just an example architecture of what your application might look like when it's deployed to the cloud. So collecting information not just from our microservices, but also from the underlying infrastructure as well, utilizing OTLP. We're in tech. We love acronyms. It's like speaking in Latin half the time. Um, so I do try and, um, coming from a biology background, it was really confusing when I joined. Uh, so I do try and explain these acronyms every time. But if I don't, shout at me, and I'll, um, I'll make sure to pause and do it. So OTLP just stands for the Open Telemetry Protocol. Um, and this is essentially a specification that describes things like the encoding, the transport, and the delivery mechanism for all of that telemetry data between the sources, the intermediate nodes, like collectors, for example, and between the telemetry backends as well. So this is really uh, enables us to be able to have that sp standard we can all use, no matter what we're using um, on either end, the sources or the backend, to be able to uh, communicate easily and swap them out as we need to. Um, the collector in the middle, the one you see in bright yellow there, uh, this is an intermediary node. Uh, so this is really a vendor agnostic implementation on how to receive, process, and export telemetry data. Normally, it's a single binary that's deployed either as an agent or a gateway. Inside the collector, it usually looks kind of a little bit like this. Um, you might be wondering sort of why would I need an intermediary node? Like, can't I just send the data from the source straight to the back end? Um, I would say that if you're just trying out and getting started and trying out open telemetry, you don't have to use a collector if you don't want to. If you've got a really small project and you just want to try it out, that's fine. Um, because you can get value very quickly by not using a collector and just sending that data through with that standardized format. However, in general, we would recommend using a collector alongside your service, because what it allows you to do is to offload things like um, data quickly, and the collector can then take care of any additional data processing you need. Things like batching, um, encryption, for example, retries, and any even things like sensitive data filtering. 
you can take all of that responsibility off your own services and give those to the collector um, to have that sort of centralized process to do all of that. So we would recommend in, in production style environments that you do consider using a collector, whether it's an open telemetry collector or something else, uh, to have that sort of intermediary node to deal with all of that. Um, but uh, the open telemetry collector is, as I said, a vendor agnostic implementation of this sort of intermediary node that you can make use of. Uh, that there's different components within OpenTelemetry. Uh, so if you are interested in finding out more about these, I have put the GitHub link. Uh, it's in the README, and they have links off to each of the documentation pages for each of these different components. We're going to be using some of them in the demo today. Uh, so within the API, we have things like the stable APIs, things like tracer, span, span context, uh, meter, and baggage. Uh, most of them are fairly straightforward and kind of obvious by the name. So things like tracer, that's just responsible for creating spans. Uh, spans, it's just that single operation that I was talking about. Um, span context is what allows us to be able to add that context into the span. Uh, then we've got things like meter. That's responsible for creating instruments, which are used to report measurements. Um, and they are basically just data points from the metrics API. Um, and then baggage is a mechanism for propagating sort of the name and the value pairs to help establish those causal relationships uh, between the various uh, sort of operations. As well as that, got things like extensions. Uh, obviously, we've got all of the aspects that are to do with the SDK, so the actual SDK itself, exporters, and SDK extensions. And then we've also got two shims, one for open tracing and one for open census, those two previous projects I talked about that open telemetry came from. If you do want to check out more about this, I will be sharing my slides, or you can check out the link that I've posted there as well. Okay. So microprofile, um, I kind of mentioned this specification before, and telemetry is a brand new uh, API that's offered in the latest major version of microprofile. So this uh, was introduced just late last year, I believe, was when it came out in microprofile 6, um, and it adopts open telemetry tracing. Now, it's important to say here that open telemetry is not limited to tracing. Open telemetry also has things like metrics and logs, Right now, microprofile only enables micropro uh, open telemetry tracing. There is some complications around the fact that microprofile already had microprofile metrics. However, the plan is, and this is all open source, so it's all out there in issues in the open, so you can go check it out yourself if you want. But the plan is in future that microprofile metrics will be moved out of the standard stack for microprofile, and open telemetry metrics will be moved in instead as that single standard, so we can have more continuity between the microprofile specification and others. Uh, but right now, it is just open telemetry tracing, but hopefully metrics and logs are coming in the future. Um, but yeah, so my open telemetry tracing, that's why it's the one I'm focusing on today. It offers, as I said, that set of APIs, the SDKs, tooling, and integrations that I kind of went through just now. And it's designed to be able to have easy creation and management of telemetry data. There are three different ways to implement microprofile telemetry in your Java applications. The first one is super simple, and you don't even need to make any code or configuration changes. It's exciting, I know. Uh, so the first one is automatic instrumentation. So if you're already using Jakarta RESTful Web Services or um, MicroProfile REST client, you can already automatically enlist your microservices in distributed tracing. So there will already be some available for you just by enabling it um, in things like your server.xml file, which I'll show in a minute. So that's super easy. That's the first step. The second step is manual instrumentation. So if you want any tracing on things like database connections or anything other than what you're using for Jakarta RESTful Web Services or MicroProfile REST Client, you'll need to use manual instrumentation. This is where we add um, traces via annotation. So we've got annotations like at with span, or we can do it with an additional MicroProfile API, which is called CDI injection, context dependency injection. Um, and that allows us to be able to use things like inject tracer or inject span, or alternatively, we can also use programmatic lookup. If you're familiar with microprofile, you will be familiar with annotations because that's how most of the microprofile APIs work, which is why it's been implemented in this way. But I will try, if we have time, and show manual um, instrumentation as well as automatic. The last one, which I'm not going to have time to show in my demo today, but is part of the guide, it's like a little teaser. Like, see more. Try it out yourselves afterwards, and you can try out the, the agent instrumentation. This is where we're able to sort of uh, use open telemetry Java instrumentation to be able to gather telemetry data, again, without any code modification. 
Um, so hopefully making this sound quite appealing because you don't have to delve into all the code, hopefully, if you don't want to. So how does it work? Um, it's kind of a similar diagram to what I showed for the um, sort of overall architecture of how this sort of comes together. In our application, we've made it really simple just so it's it, we've tried to make all of our guides use the same application, the same simple application, because that way you don't have to learn what the application's doing every time. You can just focus on learning that new technology. So in this case, we have two microservices, the inventory and the system microservice. They're communicating to each other, and we're collecting um, context and spans and all this information via microprofile telemetry, which is using open telemetry under the covers, um, and sending that to our backend exporter. The nice thing about all of this is that, as I said, it works with lots of different tools, um, observability backends, um, and platforms. So in our case, we're going to be using Jaeger, but really it's up to you as to, as to what you use in your own applications. So with that in mind, we're going to go to the demo. As I said, for this, we're going to be using Open Liberty. For anyone who's not come across it, do go and check out the Open Liberty website. We've got tons of information on there. Um, I'm going to be biased and showcase my own article here. Um, shamelessly plug this. So I've written an article about uh, why cloud native developers love Liberty with some examples of sort of the performance benefits and that kind of thing. If you're interested, check it out. Uh, but I'm not going to spend too much time on that because you can read it afterwards. So as I mentioned, we've got loads of interactive guides. You can use these. They're all freely available. There's about 65 now, I think, on lots of different cloud native APIs and technologies. So do go check them out if you're interested. This is just a screenshot from the observability section. And we're going to be looking at the second one here, the one that says new, because it's exciting. Uh, and that's the one we're going to be doing today. If you see any of them that say running cloud, those are the ones that you can run in our browser-based environment, which I'll be demoing today. If they don't have that label, or if you'd rather run it locally, totally fine. Just make sure you're looking at the dependencies that we, we prereq um, at the top of the guides if you are going to do that. Our browser-based environment looks a bit like this. Uh, so it's based on the Thea IDE. Um, you can use it in pretty much most browsers. Safari is a bit eh, but hopefully you're using Firefox or Chrome or something like that. Um, so in here, we've got the instructions on the left-hand side. We've got the IDE on the right. And normally, a terminal appears at the bottom. But I'll show you how to open a new terminal anyway. We've also got an explorer view where you can see your uh, directory structure and find your files or your classes that way, if that's how you'd prefer to. But the nice thing is we actually have, this is a slightly older screenshot. Uh, we provide all of the commands and the code that you'll need for this. We also provide copy buttons and execute buttons, because I am super lazy and can't be bothered to move my mouse across. So we just do execute, and it will do it all for you. So you can literally do this guide in as little as 10 minutes. I've timed myself um, when I was recording a video. But normally, these guides take between about 20 minutes is roughly the average for a guide. Um, so this is the one we're going to be doing today. As I said, OpenTelemetry and Jaeger. If you do want to quickly access it, I'll just leave that up for a little minute. I can't see any phones. No, OK, I see an A phone. I was like, I'll oh, skip it if not. Um, cool, I'll leave it up there for just a minute. Cool, hopefully that QR code works. Let me know if it doesn't, because I created it today. So it works? Perfect, great. That was a good use of time. OK, so with that in mind, I'm going to switch to the demo itself. So as I said, I got to this by going to Guides. Uh, you can see there's tons of guides, loads of guides. Um, you can either search with the filter, or you can use our handy um, menu on the left-hand side. But we're doing this one today. I did mention, if you're doing it locally, make sure you're looking at these prerequisites um, on the top right uh, just before you get started. Otherwise, you're going to get stuck. In this case, we're doing it in our cloud native environment. So I've just clicked on that Running Cloud button, and it's opened a new tab. Uh, you will need to log in. We didn't have a login. And then Bitcoin miners found us. So now we have a login. Um, but hopefully, you'll be able to use a plethora of different social logins. We have GitHub. And as developers, I'm sure um, a lot of you will have GitHub accounts. If not, you can log in with LinkedIn or just an email account. It's really up to you. Um, so I've already logged in. And in the interest of time, I've already got some of this up and running just so that we can get through more of the more interesting stuff. So as I mentioned, instructions on the, right, the left-hand side. and. Um, those will explain sort of what you're going to learn in each guide. And normally, they'll also give you quite a handy little architectural diagram of what we're trying to achieve here. As I mentioned, we're using two different microservices, inventory and system. They're pretty simple microservices. The system microservice scrapes your system data every 15 seconds. And the inventory microservice takes that information and stores it in an inventory. 
that's about it. They don't do much. Um, but it wasn't designed to be a fully fledged enterprise system. It's just there to teach. Um, and what we're going to be doing is implementing that open telemetry um, sort of tracing into our project. All of our projects are open source, and they are available on GitHub. If you do want to check them out, you can see the uh, GitHub repo we provide in the Git clone, um, or you can just search for Open Liberty on GitHub and find all the guides there too. Um, I've just run this Docker run command so I can get my Jaeger backend up and running. Um, we provide that for you because this isn't really a guide about how to learn about Jaeger. Um, we have a separate guide for that, so check that out if you're interested. This is just to save time. Um, so I've already got that up and running, and I've already got my UI here for me to take a look at. Um, if you want, when I let's go to my Explorer view. Um, so if I go to my directory structure, you'll see I've got a start. Is this big enough, by the way, before I continue? Yeah? You want it bigger? No? Perfect. Um, excellent. So we've got a start directory, and we've got a finish directory. This is the same in all of our guides. The finish directory is essentially, if you, don't really, if you can't be bothered to go through the, the whole workshop, or if you just want to skip it, or if you want a reference to look at, the finish is what you should get at the end of all the instructions. It's also a really good place to refer back to if you, if you come across any bugs to see if you've accidentally introduced anything whilst going through the instructions. But the start directory is sort of a half-baked application that you're going to finish with the instructions we provide in the lab. So that's where we're going to start today. Um, so I think, yeah, I'm going to skip this because this part is you can basically try the finish directory before you go through all the instructions. But that's no fun because we want to see the surprise. So we're just going to start with the, um, with the start directory. So if you don't already have a, an extra terminal running, um, you can go to terminal, new terminal, and that will open a new terminal, normally at the bottom, but you can move it around uh, wherever you want. I prefer it there. So as I said, we've got this copy button or we've got the execute button. So to save time, I'm just going to execute. So in this case, what I'm doing is I'm going into the system directory structure, and I'm running my Maven command for Liberty Dev. Liberty Dev is a command we use to run Liberty in dev mode. What that means is that uh, it's a bit like if you come across Qu Quarkus's hot reload function. Um, it allows us to be able to have the server uh, running and listening to code and configuration changes as we make them. So instead of having to tear down our whole application server and start it again to see those code changes in real time, we can use dev mode um, and do that in a much more agile way where we can just save our class. It will automatically recompile just that class or configuration we've changed, and we'll be able to see that a change in real time. So really useful for development work, which is why we called it dev mode. So you'll know that it's successfully running in dev mode because you'll see this line of stars and this message, Liberty is running in dev mode. Now that I've got that microservice running in that terminal, I can't use that terminal for any other commands because that terminal is now listening for any uh, code or configuration changes. So I'll need to open a new terminal to be able to run the same command, but this time for the inventory microservice, that other microservice that we're using. Um, so again, I'm just um, CDing into the directory structure for the inventory microservice. If I scroll along this, yeah, you'll see inventory there. Um, and again, I'm using the same command, maven liberty dev. I could use maven liberty run, but I'd have to rerun it every time I make a change. So it's going to be a bit slow. So we're just going to use liberty maven uh, dev. So you can see that that one's also up and ready to go. So now if I go back to my original um, tab, because this one is free for me to use, I'm just going to make this a little wider. Perfect. OK, so what I'm going to do is run these two curl commands. Um, and what that's going to do is essentially just um, sort of start my system service and sort of ping my inventory service so that they're actually going to show. There we go. So you can see some information from them already. And then if I go to next, um, I should be able to see. Let's do a refresh. Cool. So right now I can just see my Jaeger query, but I can't see my microservices because I haven't enabled that tracing data to come through yet. So we're going to look at, OK, how do we enable that automatic instrumentation that I talked about? Because I'm already using MicroProfile REST and, um, sorry, Jakarta REST and MicroProfile REST client. So we're, all we're going to do to be able to enable this automatic is just enable MicroProfile telemetry in my server.xml. Again, we provided these buttons to make it really easy to open the classes you need automatically. Alternatively, we do also provide the, um, the path directory structure so you can find it yourself if you want to in the Explorer view. So I'm just going to copy and paste this whole thing across. Um, you can check out the differences and copy and paste only the difference if you want to. But I'm just going to highlight what that difference was. And it was this feature here, which is what we've added, which is for microprofile telemetry. 
Um, we're going to do the same thing because that was for the system microservice. We're going to do the same thing for the inventory microservice. So I'm just going to copy and paste that whole thing across. And you can see I've added in microprofile telemetry as a feature again. Um, do you remember if you're going to use our guides, please save. It does not automatically save. Um, so please remember to do that. And actually, whilst I remember, I can show you in here that as I've been saving those files, it's been listening and it's been reloading um, and sort of a recompiling, oh, recompiling those changes. OK, so now that I've got that, I need one last thing. I don't really know why, but weirdly, and I think it's weird, it's a bit backwards, um, by default, microprofile tracing, even when you enable it in the server XML, is defaulted to be off. I don't really get that, um, personally. But what we need to do is we need to basically set a properties file to turn it on so we can use it. Um, so to do that, we're going to be using microprofile, um, oh, not in that one, sorry, this one. In micro, we're going to be enabling it in a, micro, in a config properties file. So this is utilizing another API from microprofile, which is microprofile config. And that allows us to be able to have externalized configuration so we can easily change it uh, rather than having to dig through all our application classes. So now that we've created that with that touch command, I'm going to open it up, copy and paste in the two properties I need. So in this case, I'm just setting which service this applies to um, and weirdly disabling it to false to turn it on. It's kind of a bit backwards in my head, at least. Um, so now that we've done that for the system microservice, we can do the same thing for the inventory microservice. That file already existed because we did need a property for that. So I'm just going to replace it. And as you can see, I'm, I'm only adding the same things. The only thing that's changed here is that name from system to inventory. And again, default to false, which is weird. Um, cool. OK, so now that we've got that, I can re-hit this curl command. Um, and now, when I revisit my Jaeger UI and refresh, what you'll see is I've got inventory and system. So let's look at, look at traces. I can already open my trace and deep dive to look at the spans that were involved in that end-to-end -end request through my microservice. It doesn't look that complicated because, as I said, this is not an enterprise fully-fledged application. There's only two microservices involved, and it's not that complicated. Um, normally, you'd see maybe a lot more layers depending on how many microservices you were going through, how many operations were involved in that request. Um, but you'd be able to see that by digging into this. But as you can see, I made absolutely zero configuration. Well, I made one configuration change, really, um, and a change to my server.xml. But I didn't have to touch any of the classes that were actually providing that core functionality to my application to be able to get some of this uh, tracing uh, for my application. So this was the automatic one. OK, I've got seven minutes. Hopefully, I'll be able to get through some of the explicit tracing. OK, so if I want to use some of the annotations to be able to manually instrument that tracing, uh, as I said, I can utilize things that add with span annotation to be able to add that in. So I'm going to open my pom.xml for the inventory microservice. And in here, I'm going to add the dependency I need for this. So copy and paste. I'm going to make this smaller, add this in, save it. Um, so in here, we're adding in the OpenTelemetry API um, and the two dependencies I need. Let me scroll up so I can show you where those are. Here we go. So OpenTelemetry and OpenTelemetry instrumentation are the ones that I need to implement here. Now we need to replace the server.xml file uh, because I need to add in the ability oh, to be able to have a third party in the types of API packages that the class loader supports. So you can see I'm adding that in in this line here, um, as well as we've already got that microprofile feature that we added last time when we were doing the automatic instrumentation. Um, so what this allows us to do is to be able to um, add third party to the list of API package types that are supported. OK, um, so that now we are able to use this Jakarta CDI beans, and we're able to annotate their methods with the at span annotation. So if I open my inventory manager.java, it's one of the classes in my inventory service. Um, I provided all of the code here. Let me copy and paste that across. Oh, oh it's doing something. So it's not letting me copy everything. Never. Don't know why it's deleting. But that's fine. Let's just, there we go. My manual works. OK, if we delete all of that. Nope. Interesting. It's not loving me. The demo gods have not smiled kindly. Right, let's try and open it again. 
Let's see if that works. Nope. Okay. The demo nodes are not smiling kindly on me. But essentially, what you can see here in here, you can start to see that we're using these annotations um, on the left hand side. Let me make this bigger so you can actually see it in code form. So you can see that we're starting to add the specific annotations to be able to manually add those spans into our application for anything other than that Jakarta RESTful web service um, or MicroProfile REST client uh, requests and operations. So if we want to add uh, requests in, for example, for like database connections um, and that kind of thing, we can utilize manual uh, instrumentation for that. Whilst my demo throws a hissy fit, and considering I've only got four minutes left, I'm going to leave the rest to you as a teaser. Um, so if you do want to go through the rest of this guide, um, as I said, it goes through more of the how do you instrument manually, um, and it also goes through the agent instrumentation as well. So I'm just going to wrap up. Promise I'll be quick. Um, cool. Play from current side. So hopefully, in that whirlwind of a talk, hopefully what I showed you is that we're entering a more complex and complicated world as we're creating applications that are made of hundreds, if not thousands sometimes, of microservices and deploying them into the crazy world of the cloud. But it is through effective observability that we are able to understand and monitor our applications and that context is critical for us to be able to do that effectively, not just with logs and metrics. But the nice thing is, is you're not alone. I'm not expecting you to go and implement this yourselves. Um, there's lots of different open source tools and technologies that are there to help you. And hopefully, things like OpenTelemetry or even MicroProfile might be able to help with that. If you want additional resources, you can check out some of the links I provided here. As I said, I will share my slides afterwards. Um, and if you're interested in more stuff from Open Liberty, if it's guides or anything else, you can connect with us on uh, Twitter or X or LinkedIn. Um, I run these, so I'll say hi if you come follow us. Um, or just shout at us if there's something that's not working. Um, cool. With that, I'm going to say thank you so much for sticking with me, and I'll take any questions. Do you have some questions? No. I've just no stunned you all <laughs> into silence with so much information. I may have one question, maybe. Yeah. Um, you have presented intensively the Java uh, implementation. You mentioned different SDKs. Do you yep. have also ways to uh, instrument uh, if you have different services in different technologies, and for instance, Python or uh, uh, physical database systems or things that we connect, could connect also to also drill down in the time spent on back-end uh, queries or on third-party Python uh, services? Would it be possible? Yeah, so by using the open telemetry protocol, you're using that standardization. Yeah. Um, it's not just available in Java. It's available in multiple different languages. So as long as you're using that standardization, it shouldn't matter about what you're using in terms of language or runtime or backend tool. Um, you should be able to connect in to sort of um, connect them together and gain that observability data. But I think, is your example in multiple languages or is it only in Java? Yeah. So in addition to what, what uh, she said, just on the instrumentation side, the Java, uh, sorry, the Open Telemetry project has uh, SDKs and also auto, auto instrumentation agents for different languages. Yeah. So if you use uh, that, obviously is less about the uh, micro profile, which is Java specific. But you can use the native SDKs for each language. There's one API and one SDK for each programming language, and also for many of them, auto instrumentation agents, client libraries, and so on. And then this is the instrumentation, and once it's exported, as long as it's standardized, then all from there onwards, the collector and the backend will already see a unified data model based on the open specification. Yeah, so I don't have a demo that shows more than just Java, but it's, as you say, it's possible by using sort of the, the standardizations, the SDKs that are provided in the open telemetry. And then, say, in your Java application, you could use the micro profile or the, st the native open telemetry if you wanted. Depends what you're used to and what's more convenient. And maybe yeah. also in the project, it's in Open Telemetry. There's a, a demo, community demo, maintained by the community. That's like called the Astronomy Shop. So the, the telescope would suggest why. And this shows a, a polyglot uh, application with many, yeah, yeah. Uh, many programming languages and a Redis cache and a database and so on. So it's actually a good way to just install it and explore uh, many prog many programming languages and many components, third-party components, all gathered into one and showed uniformly. Thanks. Thanks for the question. No further questions? Cool. Well, I'm around for the next few days. Otherwise, bug me on social media.
Thanks, Thanks guys. Again.